Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, most of what I'm going to say is actually in your report on your desk, so I could skip a bit of my talk, but I'm going to take you through it anyway. Uh, so I'm going to be talking, my name is Jonathan Thomas, I work for DEC, and I've been talking about what you've been doing in terms of cooperating with industry on the UK EOR programme over the last couple of years. We're at a kind of stage, we've completed the first bit of work, which is covered in this report, and we move on to a second phase, which I'll discuss. Uh, so getting back to why we need EOR in the North Sea, as Steve mentioned, the average worldwide recovery factor from oil fields is probably at the mid-30s percent. UK offshore, we ex at the moment, on current plans, we expect the average recovery factor for an oil field to be 46% 40 of the oil originally in place. And it's a very similar recovery factor for Norway. That's quite remarkable to me, that different strategies in Norway, but very, very similar ultimate recovery factor which means, to be honest, we're leaving more oil in the ground than we're taking out. So if you like, the challenge, the stretch target for the, this EOR work over the last couple of years is, can we move towards a stage where we're producing more oil than we leave behind for the North Sea? Uh, it, those, that's the summary for the northern North Sea and central North Sea, where most of the oil fields are. And you can see we've really produced about 41%, and there isn't much left on just current plans. So. It really, we've got to go and move on to get the EOR going. Similarly, although we've got a lot of new developments coming forward, the basic total production figures have been going down. This is due to the maturity of the North Sea, and it means that it's a limited time frame to get EOR projects moving. As so the deck is really trying to put a lot of resource to try and crack the problem. So far we've got two EOR projects in North Sea which I'll discuss shortly. We've got another one coming forward but that's out of a hundred fields. We like to get up to a dozen if we can. Uh, so there's a, I don't know how many of you heard of the pilot initiative. Pilot is like a, it's industry, government working together in cooperation to try and solve some of the fundamental problems that are holding back oil and gas development. It doesn't just cover EOR. I mean, I work in the pilot EOR work group, but it covers all aspects of production. We've got uh, production efficiency, which is a very important area. There's been a drop off in production efficiency in recent years, but anything we can do to get production efficiency back up will help the life of the North Sea. It covers commercial agreements, improved oil recovery, by that I mean infill drilling, best practice in handling facilities. It covers access to infrastructure to make sure that small developments come forward in a timely manner. So the pilot initiative covers the whole you like supply chain for oil and gas development in the North Sea, but the UR is an is essential component of that. And that's what I'll be concentrating on for the rest of the talk. Uh, Stephen talked about this in terms of if you look at the oil field, you can break it down into several components of sweep. You can talk about the poor scale displacement here. This is what's happening at the at really the small scale, at the core scale. And when you get bypassed oil left behind or residual oil, that's a, a principal target for EOR. We've got sweep and drainage. What's the heterogeneity in the reservoir? Is up areas of poor sweep due to that? Is the well pattern good? And time relates to how long are your facilities going to last? If your facilities are, aren't in very good shape, it could mean that your field's going to come to a premature end. So you've got to really look at it as an integrated whole. If you have an intervention on EOR, which part of this uh, overall recovery analysis is it attacking? And it's no good doing EOR on its own. You've got to make sure you look at all aspects of this. If you do an EOR project, you have to make sure the facilities are fit for purpose to last the duration of the EOR project, for example. Uh, I won't say much about that slide. It, that was really the, the challenge at the beginning of the pilot EOR program, to you know, be a catalyst for more EOR projects than North Sea and facilitate better collaboration between companies. I mean, traditionally, in North Sea development, companies have tend to go their own way and there's been little collaboration collaboration between 
separate developments, but we're trying to get around that problem. And overall, trying to increase our confidence in EOR development. Uh, most companies in North Sea are fairly risk averse, particularly when it comes to EOR. It's seen as complicated, it's seen as expensive. So can we, by getting data sharing of information and sharing of learning between companies, encourage more confidence in EOR? As we started off by looking at the entire North Sea and saying, what's the prize for EOR? We had a, a kind of a screening tool which Synergy designed and ran for us. And you probably can't see, it's in the report, but it's, it looks at the main EOR technologies, low salinity, water flood, polymer, injection, miscible gas. It says, are those techniques going to work in that reservoir, first of all? And secondly, what is the potential EOR prize if it does work and works well? And we took into account the field maturity as well, because many fields in North Sea are quite high water cuts, they're quite mature. So EOR takes on an additional level of complexity there, and that was taken into account. So this is like an inventory of EOR opportunities in North Sea, and that was the basic building block of everything else we did. And from this, we produced what I call these bubble maps of North Sea oil. The size of those circles there is proportional to how much oil is in that particular reservoir as an EOR target. Some of these numbers look quite big. For example, miscible hydrocarbon flood, it's got all, over 5 billion barrels of prize, but that is, if you like, that's the unrisked technical prize. That's assuming all the 100 fields of North Sea, say 80 of those were potentially suitable for gas injection. Gas injection was applied to every one of those fields and it worked perfectly in every case. The reality of that is perhaps 10% of that is the risk number of what you realistically might get. So say 500 million barrels. But it's still a large number compared to many of the existing opportunities that are out there. But the key part of this exercise was to show clusters of potential EOR prospects where the operators of those fields could perhaps collaborate and see if they could share development costs. That was one of the concepts there. But to see which area of the North Sea are most fruitful for EOR. We, from Moore's analysis, we came up with three techniques that had most interest. Low salinity, water injection, chemical EOR, and miscible gas. And it's pleasing to say that in Stephen, we, you're those were the technologies that came out as the sort of top in tried and tested methods. So that shouldn't be much of a surprise. And we've got example of projects for each of those technologies. We've got BP's Clare Ridge project. It's going to be a low salinity EOR. It's being commissioned as we speak, but the project's being set up. We've got chemical EOR. We've got the Captain Polymer Injection project. We'll hear more about that tomorrow from Chevron. Admissible gas, we've got the very successful uh, gas injection project in Magnus Field, which is the northernmost field in the northern North Sea. So EOR definitely works in North Sea. We've got projects for each of those technologies. It's just a question of getting more of them. That's the Clare uh, platform being towed out for the original Clare development. That's the Captain FPSO. So these are pictures showing it's really happening. These are real projects. And the Magnus project. So I had a bit of trouble with this thing. Oh, there. So what did we do on each of these technologies? Uh, first of all, low salinity. We started holding... Now, when we started this process a couple of years ago, very few operators knew much about low salinity EOR, and they, they were probably even less interested in it. But we started having workshops. We brought experts across to the UK. We shared the results of our initial screening, and we, we built up quite a bit of interest in technology. And what people like about low salinity EOR is fairly cheap as an EOR technique. All you need is a supply of low salinity water. And there's not much that can go wrong with it. So it it's not like gas injection. There's some gas injection problems go very badly wrong when gas moves along a very high permeability channel, for example, and you get a lot of gas recycling. Low salinity EOR doesn't share those problems. But there's a problem is not many people, there's no real clear agreement on how the process works at the kind of chemical rock interface level. And several companies, about half a dozen companies, have now been screening their reservoirs for low salinity EOR potential. Essentially, you take a core and you flood the core with seawater, you flood it with low salinity water, and you compare the results of recovery. 
And those results have been fairly mixed to date. So there's, there hasn't really been momentum of a lot of people getting successful results and saying we ought to do low salinity here we are. So after these initial works, we had some ideas. First of all, there wasn't much agreement on how to do core floods. Some companies like Shell and BP have been doing core floods to test for low salinity EOR for many years. Other companies hadn't done any. Uh, we looked at could we companies share information better to you know, speed their learning. And we also looked at could you do projects where one supply of low salinity water, perhaps from a floating vessel, could supply several fields. It was a scope for cooperation. Uh, so the first thing we did was we produced, uh, we just had a meeting, discussed the kind of state of the art and produced some core testing guidelines, which several companies have used. You know, this was what basic things you should do to avoid getting a, just messing up your test and getting a null result for that reason. We identified some potential low salinity clusters. This slide shows the, the fields and the operators and each of these groups of operators had sort of held meetings and discussed how they could share information they got from their core tests and in terms of the problems of implementing low salinity in their fields. Uh, so people found that quite useful, that you know, promotion of sharing data and sh having a sort of more open discussion between operators. So this is, a, we had a quote from one operator, so it shows that encouraging that type of open discussion. I mean, the way that Stephen was saying, it's you need a new area, new era of collaboration to get EUR projects going. It's not business as normal. The things we're doing at the moment, we've got uh, quite a few companies, as I said, have done screening of their fields for low salinity EUR potential. We're getting uh, a study to look at those results and try and draw overall lessons, you know, why some of these tests, why didn't they work? What were the reasons for successful tests? And we're also, we're doing, we've done a separate study of ITF, which you'll hear about later today. We went out to the uh, industry and said, what solutions exist to provide low salinity water cost-effectively to a mature field in North Sea? And we got some very interesting solutions offered to us, totally subsea solutions, uh, very compact solutions that we bolted on to existing platforms. But you'll hear about that more later. But it, it, it did surprise me, A, how much technology really exists to do this stuff and how rapidly that's advanced over the last year or so. We're really close to the stage where you can have a totally subsea uh, supply of low salinity water for your development, which I find is, is quite remarkable. As Stephen mentioned, it takes a long time to do an EUR project. This slide was provided by PP and it, it shows their experience of how much it costs and this process can take 10 to 15 years. You start off core floods, see if your EOR is going to work in your field, you then might do a single well test or a chemical tracer test, you then do some interwell trials and then you deploy. The reality is we haven't got time to do that for many EOR candidates in North Sea, they're just too mature. So. Uh, Part of this process is seeing what we can do to accelerate movement. This was called the pyramid of proof. This is for a new art project going from. So, this shows that the screening study is being done on fields to test for low salinity EOR potential. If those tests are successful, how do we move from here to here, say in five years, rather than 10, 15 years? Because if we wait 15 years from finding a field, where the core suggests low salinity EOR will work to actually implementing it in the North Sea, for 90% of the fields it's going to be too late. So we have to try and accelerate through that pyramid, the pyramid of proof. And one way of doing that is by collaboration between companies and sharing learning. So I think that's an important lesson. Moving on to chemical EOR, I mean by polymer surfactant mainly. We have some industry workshops on that topic. And people felt it was more complicated and expensive than low salinity. When you do a polymer project, like the Captain project, you've got large amounts of polymer to pay for. You've got logistics of getting the polymer offshore. How do you mix it? Uh, uh, surfactant's <coughs> even more complicated because you might need a different surfactant for every reservoir. And so there's probably less enthusiasm <coughs> initially. And 
no, we couldn't see clusters of fields in the same way as we could for low salinity EOR. So people were a bit more cautious about this. Although saying that, the potential prize from, say, a surfactant flood is much higher than it would be from polymer or perhaps low salinity because you really reduce the residual saturation with that technology. Uh, so we had these, after the initial workshops, we said, let's develop a list of polymers best suited for North Sea applications. The original feeling was that North Sea fields were generally too high a temperature, too deep, the, the water was too saline, the, 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 a number of issues were raised. And could we have set up some joint implementation projects to look at solutions? Because as Stephen said, when you're doing the UR project, it's not just looking at the subsurface issue, what polymer or what's the fact is suitable for your field. It's also, let's work out how to implement this offshore on a mature facility. That stuff has to be done in parallel. Uh, data sharing is proving quite challenging in this area. There's a lot of proprietary information associated with chemical UR that people don't want to give away. Uh, this was interesting. We talked to a few polymer suppliers and surfactant suppliers, and this shows for polymer how the envelope of operability, how it's improved from where we were many years ago in terms of this uh, envelope shows the range of conditions, that the temperature limits, the uh, salinity limits, the depth limits. So in the last well, since the 70s and the last 10 years in particular, huge progress was made in the applicability of these chemicals to reservoirs. So many reservoirs where you could have ruled out polymer, say, 10 years ago, are saying it's never going to work. Now polymers exist to do that job. So there's some of these chemicals, polymers may not have been used that in many fields as yet, and they might be expensive, but these issues can be addressed. But the technology has moved on. When we had these initial meetings with companies, I had the feeling that several of the, a lot of the people had they'd been trained in say they'd done the MSCs or whatever a few years back and they thought that was the limit of polymer technology they hadn't really appreciated how far you know chemical com chemical companies have moved in making these products more wider ranging applicability uh, we see quite a lot of polymer pot potential in the quad nine fields in North Sea these are the heavy oil fields like Mariner, Bresse, Bentley, new fields that they were too difficult to develop. A lot of them are quite old, they were discovered a long time ago, but they're now sort of coming on stream. And this is the kind of green field where polymer could have a lot of potential. So we're looking at that quite closely. And sort of in, it may be that polymer's not applicable early on in the first stage of development because it, it's not really well understood enough or it may be too expensive to implement. But your deck's keen that enough flexibility is there in the facilities to deploy polymer at a later stage if it's shown to have a, a good impact for you are. And that's what we did with the captain project. We made sure that when we approved that development, flexibility was in there to allow polymer to be deployed at a later stage. <coughs> if we hadn't done that, there couldn't have been a polymer project on that field. So I think it's important to, if you don't have polymer at uh, an EOR project from day one, ensure you've got flexibility in your facility particularly for new facilities, to allow it to happen. Uh, also, DEC has joined as a, a, a JIP run by IFPN in France, looking at processing uh, the problems of processing EOR chemicals, both onshore and offshore. So if you've got a chemical EOR project with surfactant or polymer on an offshore project, how do you handle those chemicals? What are the environmental implications? What's it do to your water separation kit? These are important questions that have to be resolved as quickly as possible. Now moving on to the, the final phase of the historic work, looking at miscible gas EOR. I say we've got a couple of projects in North Sea, Azula in Norway, there's Magnus in the UK. And we're also from this aspect looking at both CO2 EOR and hydrocarbon gas, in particular how you might join up CO2 EOR prospects North Sea and the UK carbon capture and storage policy, and you'll hear more about that tomorrow also from my colleague David Rutland from DEC, who works in the Office of Carbon Capture and Storage 
Uh, now, when it comes to looking at CO2, our, I mean, we are s talking to several major operators about potential projects. And it's interesting, some of these operators have come forward to DEC and they've said, we're very interested in CO2, or we'll are what make it happen. We realise there's no certainty yet on CO2 supplies, but we need to talk to you now to see what can be done and say perhaps in, is the change in tax needed or what's needed to plan the CO2 EOR project in conjunction with what's like to happen on CCS policy. Uh, now you could imagine, we had a question earlier about how you manage the uh, intermittent flows for CO2 EOR project. We need a lot of CO2 to begin with to get the EOR project started and you, that drops off as you get more mature. And if you can start to look at potential area developments, now GoldenEye is one of the two projects in the UK CCS competition. It's storing a CO2 from a power station, a Peterhead power station, in a uh, disused gas reservoir. Now you can imagine these fields marked in red are all fields that the, in our deck screening study identified as having potentially good CO2 EOR potential. You can see these are fields are all clustered in the central North Sea. So you can imagine several of those fields forming a, an area CO2 EOR scheme. Now, under that, you can have a field perhaps like Golden Eye or the Captain Aqua beneath it could act as a, a store for CO2 which can be used to supply those fields as adding flexibility to the way you manage your CO2 EOR. These are all kind of blue sky concepts at the moment, but it's the kind of thing we're looking at to see what, how it can be made to work. I mean, in my view, there's probably a good half dozen quite promising CO2 or CO2 EOR candidates, but none of them are rushing to come forward at the moment. So we're having dis early discussions with companies, but it is very, very difficult to make it work. But I'll be interested to see what is said, particularly tomorrow, what others are doing in this arena. Uh, this slide kind of summarises where we are at the moment. I said. Um, We've, we've calculated the size of the prize for its CO2 EOR. Although the headline figure might be six billion barrels of prize, I think the actual economically realizable figure is like to be between 500 million and a billion. Uh, we've, we've said we've done work on low synergy EOR. We've got core testing procedures in place now that people can access. Uh, we've got uh, work going on on how to deploy low salinity water cost-effectively offshore. We've got GIPs going on polymer injection. We've got uh, in the CO2 we are, I talk to companies about how to do that in conjunction with the UK CCS policy. So that's what we've done so far. And the question of what we move doing next. Now we think over the last two years we've built up a lot of awareness of EOR opportunities in the North Sea. Companies uh, looking quite actively at EOR opportunities in their portfolio. So the next stage is to have what we call EOR reviews. These are detailed face-to-face -face discussions with operators of the fields we believe have most EOR promise, but projects not going forward at this point in time. I mean, despite all this work I've talked about, we still ha only have two EOR projects in North Sea, Captain and Magnus, and we have Claire coming forward. So we would like to see more projects rolling forward so what can we do to unlock these? So the EOR reviews we're holding are all about talking about the EOR opportunity in more detail. What are the blockers to this project? Does it need some kind of fiscal relief? Does it need a new technology to be able to uh, perhaps lead to more, more efficient implementation of surfactant flood in North Sea? At the same time, we've had a major review of regulation in North Sea by City and Wood. The, um, advert for the new CEO of this oil and gas authority is out in the press at the moment so I encourage you to look at those if, that if you're interested uh, so the Wood Review stressed the importance of EOR and said industry should be encouraged to work together with government to find try and get more projects coming forward so I've talked about companies now after all the work we've done on promoting EOR, EOR over the last couple of years they should be aware of the EOR opportunities in their portfolio. However, not as many EOR projects as we like are coming forward. 
and at the same time, there's very limited opportunity for you, uh, perhaps 10, 15 years in some of the more mature fields. So the ERR views, there are kind of, they are structured discussions. They're based on something called the Reservoir Technical Limits Process. There's an SP paper, which I've got the number of, and I can give you a more detailed reference if someone asks me at coffee. But this is a structured process for comparing opportunities. You look at a field, you say, what's the current status? What are the forward options? You might have infill drilling. You might have uh, upgrading gas compression. So how does EOR fit into that portfolio of opportunities? And what's holding EOR back? And is there anything that the company or is there anything the government can do to get around <coughs> that barrier? I won't talk about that slide, I've talked about that already. There we are. So we're hoping these ERR reviews, we've had the, we had the first one a couple of weeks ago and that was very informative. So when we hold these reviews, in terms of DEC, what we bring to the table, we bring the DEC field team, these are the people who've been working on the field for many years in the, our Aberdeen office. We bring our, our consultants, in this case Synergy and Genesis along. We bring external experts. We brought someone from the uh, International Research Centre in Stavanger over for this first review because it concentrated on polymer flooding. So we want it to be a, a forum for positive discussion between the operators and DEC. Identify what needs to be done and by when to get EOR projects moving. Or if they can't, be, if the EOR project doesn't work, let's actually find out why it doesn't work and kind of close that opportunity down in a structured way. Uh, yeah, finally, I just want to acknowledge that <coughs> pilot EOR relies on both governments and industry to run it. And each of the pilot strands of work has an industry lead. And for the EOR lead, it's Trevor Garlick, who's head of BP in Aberdeen. Uh, he's been very instrumental in pushing this. And also like to acknowledge support of Oil and Gas UK, who have been very helpful in getting things done. So uh, I'm now open to questions. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs>